Okay, let's uh, have a, sh a short burst and a consecrate, uh, consecrated, no, concentrated burst. Okay, you got your wits about you? Uh, something that's very difficult. Hebrews doesn't speak about the ordination of Jesus into the priesthood, but the perfection of Jesus as high priest. He doesn't speak about our ordination into the high priestly office together with Jesus, but our perfection together with Jesus. Now, don't be freaked out by the term. Uh, the problem lies in English, not in uh, Greek and not in German. Uh, remember, telos means goal, and uh, perfection means bringing to the goal, and therefore bringing to completion. Uh, bringing to completion, bringing to the goal. Okay, uh, you have uh, 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 the uh, uh, notion of perfection uh, uh, has particular, uh, 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 you're particularly distracted here in North America because of the strength of uh, the Methodist movement and the various churches that come out of the Methodist movement. Now they define perfection as moral perf perfection. Moral perfection. Remember that uh, Wesley taught that the Christian life uh, consisted in two stages. First of all, you had conversion, the experience of conversion, which was identified with justification. That's behind us. That's stage one, leading up to conversion. And then comes stage two. Uh, stage one, conversion, foundation of faith, justification. So for Wesley, justification is, occurs at one point in your life, which is at your conversion. And then after that, you get the uh, process of sanctification. And sanctification is understood basically in, terms of, in moral terms, becoming more and more perfect morally, until you reach the stage of uh, uh, complete holiness, perfect love, uh, which is perfection. And for him, he taught that this could happen already in this life. Uh, but luckily he didn't define it terribly closely, but it was perfect love, which meant basically that you were sinless. He never claimed to have reached that stage, but many of his followers did and still do. Uh, now, that's morphed off into the Pentecostal movement and its derivatives. Uh, the Pentecostal movement came out of the question, okay, how do we know what if the proof that we're born again is conversion? What's the proof that we are perfect? Baptism, Baptism by the Spirit. Uh, being filled with the Spirit, the filling with the Spirit, uh, which is, uh, 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 and, and you know you're filled with the Spirit because you've spoken in tongues. And so once you are, have be, been converted and spoken in tongues, you are a born-again, spirit-filled believer. Does that sound familiar? Okay, that's, there's much more of it there that, uh, in your, many of your members than you realise. And the whole notion of the Christian life as consisting of, if you like, three stages. Le the first stage leading up to conversion and the experience of conversion. The second stage, sanctification leading to perfection, although that term's not used quite so much now anymore. And then the third stage, which is the, um, uh, uh, what happens then when you are perfect, when you are filled with the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit. You are Spirit-filled believers. Um, right. Now, um, when the New Testament speaks about perf per perfection, it doesn't speak about perfection in moral terms, but in spiritual terms, and dare I say, liturgical terms. So, uh, the uh, perfection of Jesus, the perfection of Jesus as high priest is not his sinlessness. Um, why is it obviously not the sinlessness of Jesus? He always was sinless. He always was sinless. 
And so there's no reason for Jesus to be perfected. Now, Hebrews says that Jesus was perfected as high priest at his uh, ascension. Okay? What's meant? As I said, uh, what the uh, word that lies behind uh, this term in Hebrews is telos, which has to do with your, the, the end, the goal, the completion of something. And from that comes the verb telio, which means to bring to the goal, to complete, to finish. Now, uh, in our English tradition, we usually translate that verb telio as perfect. Uh, but German, much more helpfully, talks about, uh, Luther translates it as vollbringen, which means to bring to completion, to bring uh, fully, to bring to completion. Now, if I were doing um, New Testament translation, that's the way I would translate it, uh, particularly here in North America. Now, what's God's telos? What's God's goal for us as Christians? It's our full participation in the divine service. Uh, participation as much as we are able and as much as we are equipped to do already here and now, beginning with our baptism, but culminating in our death and resurrection. Uh, and at our resurrection, we will be fully equipped to participate fully, completely, entirely, totally, wholeheartedly, uh, physically and mentally and spiritually, together with the angels and together with Jesus in the service of his heavenly Father. That's our telos. That's our goal. That's where, where God wants to bring us. And that's the goal that God had set for humanity right at the beginning when he created human beings, not just to work together with him seven days, but that was the goal that God had set when he rested on the seventh, seventh day and he blessed and he sanctified the seventh day. The seventh day, the day that has no end. There's no evening and, evening and morning at the end of the seventh day. The goal is already there. Okay? That's the goal. Um, so the noun teleotes translated as perfection, is both an educational, vocational term and a liturgical, spiritual term for the completion of preparation for full service of God. First of all, educational term. If you like, it's a catechetical term. It's preparing people uh, for baptism and through baptism to participate in Holy Communion. So they become communi communing members. Uh, but it's a vocational term, secondly. So it's educational. It's vocational because it has to do with our preparation to serve together with Jesus. As a high priest, together with Jesus. To serve God the Father, together with Jesus. Vocational. Um, it's liturgical because our service of God is not political, um, in the sense that we then start running the world politically, but we serve with God in the divine service by participating in the divine service, offering uh, service uh, uh, to the living God, God-pleasing service to him. Now, this term, look, as I go, if there's any questions, I'm going fairly quickly. Uh, to allow a little bit of time just before chapel, if possible. Yes, Jeff? Well, I just want to make sure I'm clear. At our baptism, we're justified, and that's perfect and complete in the sense of the righteousness of Christ is perfect. Our sanctification is a process that we go through. We never complete in this life, but as we are sanctified, that doesn't add to our justification because it's perfect. Um, you, you, that's half right. Okay. Uh, the second part, sanctification, you're right. It's an ongoing process. It doesn't add 
to our justification, but it's built on our justification. But even uh, we are justified in Christ. Christ is our righteousness. And uh, here's where the Luther's teaching is very, very helpful, which is biblical teaching, because uh, Paul talks about Jesus being our righteousness, our holiness, and wisdom of God for us. Jesus is our righteousness, and that means that even though we are justified, forgiven, uh, 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 we don't possess it. We have it only in Christ. And so every day we need to be uh, just, we need to receive the righteousness of Christ. We need to confess our sins and uh, receive forgiveness. So what does such baptizing with water signify? It signifies that the old Adam in us should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die, and daily a new man, a new person, shall come forth and arise, who shall do what? Live before God, in the presence of God, in righteousness and purity forever. Notice justification and purification are uh, joined together there. Uh, we live in a sinful world, we sin, and as we sin daily, we need to be justified daily in that sense. We need to receive uh, what was made available to us in our baptism in Christ. And this is one of the big differences between Lutherans and Reformed people. Uh, uh, it's never a completely clear cut, uh, but uh, 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 there's great emphasis in the Reformed tradition on the finished work of Jesus, and there's a half-truth in it. The work of atonement is finished. The sacrifice has been offered. There's no new sacrifice. Uh, uh, Jesus doesn't have to die again. That's finished. But he won forgiveness for us, but then... Luther says the forgiveness that he won for us needs to be delivered to us. So what he won for on us on the cross needs to be delivered to us and we need to receive it by faith daily. We never possess it in ourselves. We have it fully, entirely, totally in Jesus. His blood covers us, makes us perfectly righteous and uh, pure and even holy, uh, uh, that's reckoned to us as our righteousness. <coughs> it is in Jesus, and yet we need to receive it daily. Uh, that's part of the mystery that people find, particularly Westerners find, almost impossible to get their heads around. We want to divide everything into stages. Stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. Um, there's no room here for paradox. Uh, and mystery. Uh, now, it's very important that you get your heads around this clearly because of you, you live and work in a Protestant ocean here. And the default theology, the popular theology, is always going to be, uh, now at the present age, uh, three-stage living. Are you a born-again, spirit-filled uh, believer? Uh, which means... Have you had the experience of being converted? Uh, and then secondly, have you had the experience of being filled with the Spirit? And then coming out of that, do you live by the power of the Holy Spirit? Do you live a victorious, Spirit-filled life, a joyous life, the other side of the cross? Right? That's the default theology uh, that's being propagated in a million different ways all around you. And it's very hard to, be, uh, uh, to get a, the ear of people to hear what the Bible actually says, let alone what uh, the Orthodox tradition says, the Orthodox Christian Catholic tradition says, let alone what Lutheran teaching is. Yes? I think a great picture of the Lutheran understanding is Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Mm -hmm. Certainly they had left the house clean in the morning, but they come back. They are clean, but yet they picked up, yes. you know, during the day, the dust of being out yes. and, and what, you know, what they got themselves into. So just the feet are washed yes. and there's a, a cleansing by him. Yes. But, 
But it doesn't have to be like Peter, who's insisting, you know, do me totally. First, I don't yes. want the sacrament, yes. then I want to change it. Yes, yes. That's typical Peter. He goes from one extreme to the other extreme. Or you can see it very clearly in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we don't just ask for daily bread, but we ask every day for forgiveness. Uh, the Lord's Prayer contradicts that theology. Uh, why do we pray? Forgive us our trespasses every day. Um, yes? With the, with the Western thought, as you say, it crowds in on the default about that. The other thing, do you think in terms of this, as you have displayed it, that constantly participating in the divine services, we tend to look upon this Christ, the forgiveness and so forth, as assets we take to ourselves and hold rather than things that hold us? Yes. Yes. Or um, that's one way of putting it, and that's a very good way of putting it, uh, that, we, uh, 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 that we hold possess rather than things that hold us. Uh, I'd rather say uh, it's uh, in terms of giving and receiving. These are given all the time, but we receive without ever possessing it. Uh, and there's lots of things that we keep on receiving. Take, for example, marriage and love. Do you ever possess the love of anybody? Your spouse? Uh, is the loving uh, finished on the day of marriage? Uh, I'd hope not. It's the foundation, the vows are the foundation for uh, the giving and receiving of love. Uh, uh, you never possess a spouse, you keep on receiving a spouse. You never possess love, you keep on receiving love. Likewise with uh, parents and children. Uh, 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 children don't possess parents, parents don't possess, and we, you learn that from bitter experience. You as parents never possess your children. You never possess their love. It can only be given, and it needs to be given every day And you. Or just take another very obvious example, uh, the light of the sun. Do we have the light of the sun? Yes, we do. But we don't possess it. Uh, uh, we keep on receiving it. And the same too with life. We have the illusion that we possess life, but in reality, what happens? We keep on receiving life from outside us. And that's the Lutheran emphasis on extranos, the thing that's the externals, the things that come from outside us. Um, uh, sure, they, we receive it into us, but we never possess it. Uh, so uh, our stance is always before God, we are beggars rather than uh, spiritual millionaires. So it's like food, water, and air. We can never have enough to never need more. That's right. Yes. Necessary. Yeah, all, all the basic nourishment. Uh, do, okay, I start breathing. Um, does the first breath that you take suffice to last you for the rest of your life? No, you've got to breathe every, every, uh, so, no, every minute. You uh, need to breathe. You need to receive the air. You don't possess the air. You keep on receiving the air. Uh, you don't, uh, uh, you know, once you've had the first... Uh, 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 suck of your mother's breast it doesn't give you the nourishment for the rest of your life uh, you need to be nourished every day to grow and it's the same too with our spiritual life nothing is possessed everything is received so Paul says to the Corinthians in uh, who held, were regarded themselves, as, or uh, there was a faction in Corinth who were the spiritual high flyers, the spirit-filled uh, kind of people who felt that they were living in heaven already now and, and living beyond the resurrection. Uh, he says, what do you have that you have not received? And the implication is what do you have that you have not received and what do you have that you don't have to keep on receiving? And if you have not received it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Um, and we keep on receiving everything spiritual. Now, that's the difference between spiritual gifts and earthly gifts. I can possess a watch, but I can't possess the Holy Spirit. I can't possess Jesus. I can't possess eternal life. 
even in heaven, it will be always received. Uh, because we don't generate it from ourselves. It comes to us from God, and it can't be had apart from God. Uh, it's a bit another analogy, and I use lots of different analogies, because I, if there's one thing that I found hardest to teach, it's this central reality. Uh, let's take this, uh, I think this is a fluorescent light up here. Okay, uh, does the fluorescent light shine by itself? It can only shine as long as it Receive. receives electricity and keeps on receiving electricity. It is, can only shine as long as it's empowered electrically. Uh, uh, it's, it needs to receive uh, the power to shine, and unless it, as soon as it stops receiving it, it dies, it goes out. Uh, very important goal. Um, now, how did I get onto that? I won't get this finished. Never mind. Now, uh, 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 perfection. The term perfection, um, its various de derivatives, comes from the Septuagint and the term uh, teleosis, used in the Septuagint, uh, for the ordination of priests. And it translates a Hebrew idiom. Uh, which the, the term in Hebrew for ordination is the filling of the hands. The filling of the hands. Uh, uh, let me give you the short story, first of all. Notice it. Every day, over seven days, the candidates for ordination uh, uh, received the meat and the bread the leftover meat and bread, part of the meat, part of the bread was burnt on the altar, but most of it, uh, taken from the ram of ordination, was put into their hands. Now, their hands were filled with the sacrificed meat and the sacrificed bread. Get the basic picture? So God fills their hands. Now, it's these things, and no, just get the picture always. These are the things that they bring to God. The offerings, what the basic offerings? It's meat and bread. But the, these are also the things that they receive from God as their daily bread, as their holy food from God, the food by which God feeds them uh, in their service as priests. So their hands are filled with these holy things. And so uh, the, the Hebrew is the filling of the hands. Uh, uh, in Greek, it's the, it, the, the idea is of the completion of the hands, okay? meaning com completely full. So it's not just a little bit, a, a, a wafer of bread, but there's a huge amount of meat and bread, more than you can eat is there. So the hands are filled. Uh, they're completely full. So the hands are completely full. Now that's the term for the ordination of priests. Teleosis uh, of the chiron, the filling of the hands. Uh, now that's the term that Hebrews bor borrows to talk about our ordination as uh, priest, the ordination of Jesus as priest and our ordination together with Jesus. Now let me take you very quickly through the uh, ritual of ordination. As I said previously, uh, the candidates for priesthood uh, uh, were uh, uh, ordained over seven days. Why seven days? Seven days of creation. It's the perfect number. It's the complete number. So the seven days then culminated in the eighth day. So you have seven days leading to day eight. And day eight was the, uh, 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 when they, for the first time, uh, celebrated uh, the divine service. Uh, they, for the first time, acted as priests in the divine service, fully priests. So, uh, in Leviticus chapter uh, 8, you have the uh, description of the ordination of priests over seven days, culminating with day 8 in the inauguration 
of the divine service in Leviticus. Now, what happened over those seven days? Every day, a animal was sacrificed as a sin offering on behalf of all the candidates of the priesthood. Every day, uh, a ram was offered uh, for the ordination of these priests, and something strange was done with the blood from the ram of ordination. Some of the blood was taken, uh, and you, normally the blood is poured out on the altar in the rite of atonement. But uh, on this day, there was, there was something different. The blood was taken, and some of the blood was put on the right, the, the lobe of the right ear, put on the thumb of the right hand, and on the big toe of the candidate for ordination. Now, the blood that had been applied on the altar uh, in the rite of atonement, part of that was put on the ear, the thumb, and the big toe. Now, work out the, uh, uh, not the significance of that, but work out what that does. What's done to the priest? It purifies the hearing. Right? It purifies their ears so that they will listen to and obey the voice of God. Thumb, right hand. It purifies their hands so that they are equipped to handle the holy things of God. Big toe. Okay, that purifies their feet so that they can walk on holy ground without desecrating God's holiness. Uh, notice it starts with the ears. Obedience to God's voice, listening, opening their ears, cleansing the hearing. Uh, then it goes to the thumbs, handling holy things. Uh, feet, uh, uh, equipping them to walk on holy ground to come into God's presence. Yeah, I think we better stop, otherwise we'll be late. <laughs>